So now I'm going to spend the next 15 minutes being self-conscious about my feet. <laughs> but never mind that. Um, about five years ago in, in London at the Globe Theatre, there was a season that was quite extraordinary of all 37 of Shakespeare's plays performed in 37 languages by troops from 37 different countries. Um, now, it should be said, to get away with this sort of billing that they did of 37 plays in 37 languages, they did have to designate English as one language and English hip-hop as another language, but you know, that's beside the point. It was a fantastic season. I was there um, for about 10 or 12 of the plays, including a South Korean Midsummer Night's Dream and a Maori Troilus and Cressida. Um, also, the Indian Twelfth Night, the Pakistani Taming of the Shrew, which was a little too close to reality for me to really enjoy it completely, um, and a Bangladeshi Tempest, which sadly I missed. The season was fantastic, but there was all this talk around the season. Talk is problematic. Some of the talk was talking about Shakespeare and why we had these 37 countries performing Shakespeare so wonderfully, and, and the, the conclusion many people came to was Shakespeare is great and universal. And that was the beginning and end of the story. Being from the Indian subcontinent, I knew that that was not the beginning or the end of the story, certainly not as far as the troops from India, Pakistan, and Bangladesh were concerned. Um, there was a different story, and I'm going to tell you that story here today. That story goes back to 1591. Now, 1591, those of you who are Shakespeare buffs in the audience will say, oh yes, that was probably when Shakespeare was first performed at the Globe Theatre. It might have been 1592, it might have been 1590, but quite likely 1591. It's not what I'm talking about. 1591 was the year that three ships set sail from England and went all over the place as far as Sri Lanka, not that it was called Sri Lanka there, and then went back. This was the basis of the East India Company. Um, the East India Company, of course, went on to become the most powerful force in India. It didn't happen overnight. Shakespeare was successful more quickly than the East India Company was. But by the late 1700s, the East India Company was, as I said, the most powerful force in India because, of course, it wasn't just a trading company at this point. It was really the world's first private military corporation. Um, and its power was unparalleled by this point, by the late 1700s. What this meant was there were now a lot of English men, not yet women, in India. Some enterprising man, whose name I should know but don't, decided that there was a fortune to be accumulated by entertaining these Englishmen in India. Um, and so he decided to set up the first Western-style theater in Calcutta, there were probably three or 4,000 Englishmen in Calcutta at this point. So 1775, with the help of the great Shakespearean actor David Garrick in England, he sets up this theater. Garrick, for his pains, receives a gift of chintz and Madeira wine, very important. Um, and this theater is set up, and Shakespeare, among other um, playwrights, is performed, but it's, it's more Shakespeare than anyone else. The idea was that the Englishmen in Calcutta would go to this theater. But what started to happen was Indians started to go. Um, the theater became a way of them to look into the lives of these strange English people who are now so uh, powerful in their country. Um, and it became something of a social status, in fact, to go to the Calcutta Theater um, and watch Shakespeare or whoever else. Um, it did so well that a year later, 1776, you had the Bombay Theater set up um, and more Shakespeare being performed. This was the introduction of Shakespeare to Indians. Uh, but at this point, 1775, 1776, you didn't have that many Indians who spoke or understood English. A few did. There were a few in Indian families who saw that English was now the language of advancement and they were teaching their children in English. Uh, but the East India Company and the British government had no particular interest in this happening. All that changed in 1835. Um, when a man called Thomas Babington Macaulay decided that a lot of money had to be put into teaching a certain elite class of Indians how to speak English. Um, in fact, to anglicize them. Now, his reasons that he lays forth in this thing called Morley's Minute on Education, his reasons were simply that everything English was superior. Um, 
and he famously said that a single shelf of European literature is worth more than all the native literatures of India and Arabia put together. Um, and so, of course, it made sense. Um, it was only the good and moral thing to teach these poor benighted Indians the English language, Indian, English literature, um, and give them a good English education. The real reason for him wanting to do this, as he explains later on in a little, you know, in the middle of a low paragraph somewhere, is that it's really important by this point to create a class of Englishmen who will act as a class of Indians who will act as interpreters between the English and those they're governing. Um, and this class of Indians, they were of the elite, uh, were to be Indian in blood and color, as he put it, but English in morals, tastes, and intellect. Um, in other words, he wanted to cre create a class of Indians who would work for the British Empire, not that it was yet quite a British Empire. Um, and part of the process of doing that was to convince these Indians via their English education that everything English was superior to everything Indian, including culture, including literature. Um, and so, of course, you want to be on the side of the English. Uh, and, of course, it's right that the English rule. Shakespeare was the jewel in the crown, as it were, of this whole plan. Um, he was put forth as the greatest writer there ever was, so much superior to anything Indian literature had. This is, of course, problematic for me. Um, I love Shakespeare, but he was first deployed in the subcontinent in this rather messy way. However, an interesting thing happens when you inject someone like Shakespeare into a country, um, which is people start reading him and deciding to do what they want to do with him. Um, so, 1835, you have this Macaulay Minute of Education, and after that, the process of anglicizing Indians begins. 1852, you have your first full-length translation of a Shakespeare play. Interestingly enough, it's The Merchant of Venice. Um, and in the preface, which is an English language preface, the, the writer explains, uh, Harachandra Ghosh, he explains, it's in Bengali, the translation, but he explains in English that really what he's got here is a very Indian natak or drama, which has taken the plot and underplots, which is an excellent word, much better than the subplots, we must use it in future, the plots and underplots of the Merchant of Venice, and then add a lot of, added a lot of Indian stuff in there to appeal to the native audiences. Um, so 1852, that was the first full-length translation. After this, a sort of epidemic of translating Shakespeare spreads across India. Between 1870 and 1920, you have 91 translations of Shakespeare's plays in Tamil alone, right? There are only 37 Shakespeare's plays, so everyone wants to do better than the one before. Hundreds and hundreds of plays by Shakespeare are being translated in these different languages. So in other words, while the English are setting about trying to anglicize Indians via education, the Indians are setting about trying to Indianize Shakespeare, <laughs> right? Um, this was not met with universal acclaim. In 1921, there were now so many Shakespeare translations around um, that a man called Samarjit Dath wrote a book called uh, The Oriental Macbeth, in which he complained bitterly um, that Shakespeare and other kinds of English literature were now so honored um, that the native literature was pretty much completely forgotten and in his phrase was now a forbidden fruit. Um, this is 1921. Um, it's not accidental, this date, because by now, anti-colonial feeling was growing. Um, Indians hadn't yet asked for complete independence in a big way, but they were asking for autonomy. Um, there was a growing resistance to the idea of colonial rule. Um, and from this point forward, and particularly in the 30s and 40s, you see these translations of Shakespeare die out almost completely. Because whatever else you might say, Shakespeare is so involved in the imperial project in Britain that as anti-colonial feeling grows, so in some sense does anti-Shakespeare feeling. Um, but that isn't the complete story, right? I'm, I'm not going to tell you that as the story. The complete story involves one of the institutions that was set up to teach these Indian elite how to be good Englishmen. 
It was called Elphinstone College in Bombay. Um, and the students of Elphinstone College, they were taught English, they were taught English literature, they were taught Shakespeare. They performed Shakespeare on the stage. Um, and we have a little program where, which they produced when they were doing one of Shakespeare's plays. And it's very apologetic. It sort of says, look, we know Shakespeare's wonderful. We're just a bunch of Indian students. You know, we're not re we, can't, we can't really do it justice, but, you know, we're trying our best. Um, there was an attitude there that Shakespeare was somehow above them. Uh, they couldn't quite grapple with it enough. They had to be apologetic. But these students of Elphinstone College then went off and formed the first Parsi Theatre Company in the 1860s. The Parsi Theatre Company was what was considered low theatre. Um, it was not interested in deep to be or not to be moments. It was interested in melodrama and spectacle. Um, it drew a great deal on Indian mythology, religion, and legend, but it also drew a huge deal on Shakespeare. Um, but here, in the native languages, as it were, because they performed in Urdu, in Hindi, in Gujarati, in all kinds of languages, um, here they had a sense of freedom with Shakespeare. Um, and so they really played around with him. And when I say I re they really played around with him, what I mean is, in The Merchant of Venice, Portia sings a passionate love song. Um, what I mean is, King Lear is a comedy. <laughs> what I mean is, and the beginning of Twelfth Night, you know, Shakespeare gives us a, a, a shipwreck at sea and these two twins get separated. Well, in the Parsi Theatre Company's version, um, instead they're on a, play, on a train um, and there's a violent thunderstorm and the train gets derailed and falls it into the sea and then they get separated. Um, and as for their Hamlet, uh, which is called Khune Nahak, or the unjustified murder, um, the court of Denmark is so Indianized that the princesses are performing Kathak dance. <laughs> They're all chewing betel nut. And when Gertrude rise, it's not from the poisoned wine, uh, but from poisoned milk, because she was a good Muslim, it seems. Um, and that didn't stop her from dying, but anyway. Um, so this was the Parsi Theatre Company, and that was where Shakespeare really lived, and that, I think, is where Shakespeare really entered the bloodstream of India in a way that M Macaulay could not have imagined. Um, the Parsi Theatre Company did dwindle and die, but it wasn't f for reasons of colonialism. It was because everyone from was, who was watching Parsi Theatre Company then started watching films instead. And all these people who were working in the Parsi Theatre Company, or at least a good number of them, went on to become some of the founders and most influential figures in the early stages of the Indian film industry. Um, and they took with them into film all their Shakespearean influences. Um, and what that means is if you're watching Indian films and you see something like, oh, I don't know, a woman dressed up as a man to enter places she can't, or a comic sidekick who's just there to add levity to an otherwise serious scene, um, or even if you're there watching perhaps a song or a dance in the middle of the scene, what you're really seeing is the abiding influence of Shakespeare in India. Um, I want to bring this up to contemporary times just a little bit. Um, in the 90s, my father was talking to a, a professor of Shakespeare at the University of Karachi. Um, and he said, well, you know, who studies Shakespeare now? Who are your students? And he said, look, now English is the language of technology and pro progress. Everyone wants to know English, so they all sign up for English courses. Um, and when they do that, they feel they need to sign up for Shakespeare. Um, so all these tech students are now learning Hamlet. Um, he said, there is a problem, though, with Hamlet. And my father said, what's that? And he said, well, you know how everyone says Shakespeare's universal? The problem with Hamlet is in our culture, if a man dies and his brother marries the widow, that's a really noble thing to do. So these students can't understand why Hamlet thinks his uncle Claudius is this bad guy for marrying his mother when the father dies. Um, and the way they the students make sense of it is, you know, in the beginning, the ghost of Hamlet's father comes and says that your, my brother, your uncle, killed me and then married my wife. Uh-huh. Well, we don't really have ghosts in that traditional sense either. So what they worked out, actually that ghost was a very evil jinn, and poor Hamlet is misguided all along. <laughs> <Thank you. laughs>